Well, a very warm welcome to this month's edition of First Friday. It feels a little bit old school today because me and Stuart are in the studio. So yeah, apologies to those of you who are watching on YouTube or RTN. There is no video content, it's just the audio this month. We are doing a spring clean and trying to think about the visuals for the future. So do stay tuned on gnba.net to find out more about that uh, in the future. But that's not what you've come to watch or listen to here on First Friday. We are going to look at a topic. And if you've seen the thumbnail or the name of uh, this month's podcast, you'll know it's something to do with the Alpha course. Stuart, how did this come about? Somebody phoned me up and said they had a question, an issue they wanted us to deal with uh, on First Friday. And it was basically about the Alpha course and its merits, but in particular, its relationship to evangelism. Is it evangelism, properly so called? But also, is the perhaps unintended consequence of it that it's perceived as almost a replacement for our own personal responsibilities in evangelism. My understanding is it started in the 1970s, was developed by the Anglican minister who was the head of Holy Trinity Brompton. It started as a a kind of an introduction to Christianity for those new believers. So people who'd come to faith, it was a kind of an introduction to some core beliefs that Christians have. Then in the 1980s, it seemed to develop more into uh, an evangelistic course. And near the end of the 1980s, the then curate at HTB, uh, Nicky Gumbel, took it on. And it got to the point, it grew exponentially, starting from really only having two courses a year in in the 1980s through to the late 1990s. There were 10,500 courses going on each year, apparently. Today, The course is taught in over 120 languages and taught in over 100 countries. And the latest figures, this is from a few years ago now, 2018, 24 million people have taken the course. And I can tell by the smile from Stuart's face that you you found the same figures as well. I'm, I'm sure it's higher than that now as well. But that is a massive amount of people. And you've got lots of different people who who endorse the course, from Tim Keller to Bear Grylls. And imagine, Stuart, and you've alluded to some of the things that we could look to, but there may be some people today watching this, listening to this and thinking, 24 million people have been on a course telling them about Christianity. How in the world could you see that as a negative thing? Where, Where would you start then? Well, interestingly enough, a few years ago, the independent newspaper described the Alpha course as, quote, British Christianity's biggest success story, yep. unquote. And so, obviously, the figures on one level and the continuing figures on, on one level would bear that out. I want to start by saying uh, three things, two which I have banged on about before. Systematic biblical preaching from the pulpit of the local church, week in, week out. A.W. Tozer's phrase or contention, the problem with most Christians is that they don't think. Have you not got that on a T-shirt yet? Not yet. (laughs) And then also, let me add to it, the well-known verse, or it should be a well-known verse from Acts 17 and verse uh, 11 about the Bereans. They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I think that needs to be the bottom line for us all, all the time in regard to every issue. We, we live in a day in society, but certainly in the church, where I do believe that whether it's about the Alpha Course or other things that we could mention, we ask the wrong question. We ask the question, does it work? On the basis of 24 plus million you would have to say, well, yes, it it works. I think that there's a deeper question than that that we should be asking about everything. And that is not if it works, but is it right? Jesus says this in Matthew 7 and verses 17 through 20. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. 
So not does it work, is it popular, not who commends it or by the same token who would uh, warn against it, but is it right in regard to the scriptures? I have to say this is a, a... it's never really been a battle because in any church that I had the privilege of pastoring, we, we never had the Alpha course, so it was never an issue. <laughs> but it was a point of of debate that I have had really from the 90s because it really took off in the 90s, didn't it, yep. under the leadership of, of, of Nicky Gumbel. I have never been a fan of the Alpha course because I've never been convinced of the Alpha course a, of, of, of the genuine need for it and also the point of it. Holy Trinity Brompton, which is the, the church which Alpha originates, did you also know that Holy Trinity Brompton was the first church in the United Kingdom to embrace the, the Toronto blessing? I didn't, no, I didn't realise that. It no. was. Uh, and that's a fact. Holy Trinity Brompton also partners with people like Joyce Meyer and other Word of Faith teachers, Hillsong, but it also partners with the the Roman Catholic Church. Nicky Gumbel is unapologetically ecumenical and the Alpha Course is, is ecumenical. And so before we maybe get into particulars, here's an issue for me. Is there not something at least questionable, if not just plain wrong, in a teaching a course that is so bland and wide as to be ecumenical. I have real concern over any professed minister or Christian believer who wants to effectively rubbish and reverse the Reformation. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 7, or sorry, he says before the verses I quoted a few moments ago, 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate, For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Thanks for that. I wonder if I should say where I kind of generally sit with Alpha and then maybe we could address a couple of those issues that you mentioned. For me, I have a, a slightly mixed view of Alpha in that I think on the whole it is largely a good resource that uh, many different Christians can use in many different contexts. And for that, I think it is useful. It is helpful. Someone has already done the work. And so for the local church or for parachurch organizations, we don't have to reinvent the wheel when there is something that I think for what it is trying to do is fairly good at. But on the other hand, my experience of being on it has been, it doesn't seem to have worked in the way that I would have hoped it does and so can go into that why particularly but let's address a couple of those issues then I I think when I've been thinking about this and I've done a little bit of research online I saw that there were three main issues put forward about the Alpha course you've touched on two of them the ecumenical question also you really alluded to it being too charismatic which a lot of people struggle with the third I had read was this kind of idea that it can be soft on sin that it doesn't focus so much on why uh, Jesus Christ had to die in the way that he did. In terms of ecumenical, I am nervous of the ecumenical movement, and I think it blurs lines that don't need to be blurred. But I think there are certain areas where we can work together. I can work with a Presbyterian church down the road that I might disagree with on certain issues, particularly on the Reformed faith, particularly the, the five points of Uh, the tulip and I might disagree with their view on infant baptism but we could still work together to do some kind of local mission I would say in the area you and I agree on the vast majority of things but there are a few areas that we disagree on but we can still do ministry together as well the further you go down in terms of the local church ministry the more you need to be aligned and agreed I don't think alpha obviously it isn't trying to be the baptist alpha course the fact is it is trying to introduce people to some of the the core basics the very basics of who Jesus is what he came to do and so for that I think it does that fairly well. And so I wouldn't have an issue with different people using it as a starting block. And I think one of the things that the Alpha Course uh, has the option for is it's open to, to be molded. 
in my context, there were certain times when after you've watched the video, you would go off on a different angle. There's no reason why you couldn't add in something more of um, a, a, a more of a focus on sin if you want. I know a number of people who won't do the weekend away because that's just hard in their context to get people for a whole weekend away. I, I don't think there is an ironclad. You have to use the whole 11 sessions or I think as it is now. 16 sessions. I haven't seen it or been involved in it for a number of years. Putting Nicky Gumbel aside, I think he seems to be a little bit too friendly with the Catholics. I will grant you that. I don't think that shows itself in the course, as I remember it, in a negative way. You, in a local church context, start with Alpha and then you move on to something else. Too soft on sin. I mean, my church doesn't use the Alpha course, but they use Christianity Explored. But I'd imagine some of your uh, reticence towards the Alpha course would also include that because maybe there's an issue within a whole course mentality in in your mind anyway. Too charismatic? Well, there's obviously any time you have a weekend focused on the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and those things is going to wind up lots of people. Uh, for me, I think that's a good emphasis. It probably goes, maybe it goes a little bit far, but again, I don't think you have to go the whole hog to be able to use some of it. Uh, my sense is a lot of Christians downplay the role of the Holy Spirit, if anything. And so I think that is a good emphasis as well. So those are, I understand those uh, issues and I can see something in them. But I think on the whole, as I said, I have some, I have some practical issues with how it's run and who it can reach. Maybe I would tend more towards Christianity Explored, but I think... On the whole, I would say the Alpha Course is is more a tool for good than it is for bad. Okay, well, there's a lot for me to come back on there. Just a wee word about Christianity Explored, which I, I really don't know anything about. Okay. Um, but I mean, by personal experience, in the research that I've done, Christianity Explored has been described as an attempt to go beyond what Alpha would teach on sin. So that was interesting. Mm. The Alpha movement has intentionally built bridges to the Roman Catholic Church and has the Roman Catholic Church present and acknowledged on their platforms. You know I'm going to agree that I think they are not good bedfellows. I don't think it works, Protestants and Catholics. If people in our society are generally thinking that we are the same, they need to realise that we are not. You shouldn't be teaching the course to Catholics or to Protestants. You shouldn't be teaching the course to Christians. My understanding is it's an introduction, a way in for people who are neither. People who are Muslims, people who are agnostic, people who don't even know where they stand and say, I don't believe any of this stuff. Those people who've got huge misconceptions and misunderstandings about Christianity, those people who wouldn't dare go to a church building and you say, come into my house, we're going to have a meal together, we're going to discuss this thing uh, called the Bible and we're going to talk it through. I'm not going to my local Catholic church and saying, can we lead an Alpha course together? Because they have already got their understanding of what the gospel is and as wrong as it is, that's where they're at. I'm talking about evangelism. You're talking about uh, people who are already in their denominations and then we just throw in this ecumenical blanket of, 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 of shallow understanding of faith that's not it at all you want people to come to your church join your church and then you can be as protestant or as nazarene or as presbyterian as you want but when it comes to introducing people to jesus christ a culture that very much does not know who jesus is knows him more as a swear word than anything else if you can get people to come into your house and say let's talk about jesus then i think that's very different than saying give this to catholics when i hear that stuff around the Catholics and the Pope thinks it's great and he's met with this person and that person. That is ecumenical. Yes, it's dangerous. If that then taints the whole Alpha course, that's something different. But the, my understanding is the course doesn't have anything distinctively Catholic. It doesn't have anything. If anything, it's more Protestant. It just seems that he's seen, uh, Nicky Gumbel has seen an opportunity to reach a different clientele, maybe. Uh, is that wise? Probably not. I'm, I'm agreeing with you in the intention of it, and, and you have to start where people are at. What I'm saying is, though, that because the consequence and the demands of where this course takes you, these people under the, the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, and we're talking about Alpha, but this, to me, is a big part of a concern, the ecumenical tie, OK? But if they were being genuinely saved and convicted and ultimately 
they were coming out of the Roman Catholic Church and going to Bible-believing Christian churches. And I do make a distinction. The Roman Catholic Church, to me, is no different from a Muslim or a Buddhist. They, they are not the true church. So why would we want anyone to, to go to a Roman Catholic Church from an Alpha course any more than we would want them to go to a mosque? What I'm saying is if people who were, were, were professing genuine conversion to Christ and they were leaving the Roman Catholic Church in droves, the Roman Catholic Church would be up in arms about the Alpha Course. Of course they would. That's my point. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is that the, the teaching is so inoffensive in that ecumenical sense. That's what I'm saying. It just raises a question. Should, should a Roman Catholic, would I be happy for a Roman Catholic? And I'm not bashing Roman Catholics. It's We understand that. I hope that... But would I be happy for for a Roman Catholic, a practicing Roman Catholic, to be be sitting under biblical preaching and not be convicted that what they have been connected to in their past, you know, or, or their present in terms of influence by, does not line up with Scripture and therefore would not be uncomfortable by that in the same way as any other group of of, of person religious or otherwise. I agree with that. Let's say that you've got someone who has been brought up kind of nominally Catholic. They have never really been involved in the Catholic Church, but they've been told that, you know, you're Catholic, that's it. You went to a Catholic primary school and uh, you go, you've been to Mass a few times and that type of thing. Then the video that you watch is not going to address that massively, but as then you talk about Jesus and who he is, what he's come to do, then in your discussion groups... Surely you'd be able to tease out there, you know, let me show you in the Bible. But again, so many people aren't, that's going to be beyond where they're at for the for what I think Alpha can be used for. We're talking about mainly people that have got very little, if any, understanding about the Christian faith and probably wouldn't see any distinction between Protestant and Catholic. Maybe you bring that up at some point in the weeks. But I, I take what you're saying, that if someone has come in from a background of, you know, uh, I was uh, brought up in the Catholic Church, I went every single week. And um, then when I was 18, I, I walked away from it. I'm now 25 years old. Looking at the Alpha course, you would definitely want to show how the Protestant faith stands clear of the catholic church and how view on salvation view on mary view on faith and works view on prayer all those things can be brought in but for someone who's just questioning and interested that might work better in a in a discussion setting maybe but um yeah that's just coming back on you said. yes i need to come back on that again because uh, this is really important and this is good and, and it proves to the listener that, that we do not plan and rehearse what we're going to say <laughs> when we not. come into these issues <laughs> but this is really important but i'm taking it from the other end the unsaved person whoever they are has no awareness of these things but we do yeah we because we're on the inside as it were sure and because of that we have a responsibility so i then go back to, to some basic verses from Second John 7 and following, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you work for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not of God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. To me, that's the nub of it. I'm talking at this point about, on the one hand, the ecumenical connections of the Alpha Course and also where the Alpha Course comes from, going back to root and fruit, good tree, bad tree, the principle of that and the connections with the Holy Trinity Brompton has with Hillsong and the likes of Joyce Meyer and, and others, these are false teachers. I'm not saying for one moment, I do not believe that Nicky Gumbel is a false teacher. Okay, I think that he's in error. You know, I think that he's well intended. I believe that Joyce Meyer and the likes of Hillsong are false teachers. And that to me is the difference. The teaching of, of these verses from Second John, that if we partner or endorse those who have gone away from from the faith and run ahead in terms of the teachings of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church would, would check that one out on every level. 
that that we uh, are going to lose a reward, and that that that's what it says here. And so, I would want it to be so clear with any ministry that I sought to undertake that there, there could be no misunderstanding. That doesn't mean I'm I'm hammering Roman Catholics any more on a Sunday than 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 I would be hammering LGBT or whatever. Why do I talk about these? Issues, whether it be ecumenical or multi-faith or, or LGBT, why do I preach about these things regularly from the pulpit? Not because I'm, I'm, I'm hammering these people or I'm against these people. It's because the people in the church are so biblically ignorant that I'm trying to help them as a preacher I'm trying to equip them to think about these things scripturally and to be able to articulate these things because people on the pew, some people listening here, will never have had a thought about the reality of ecumenicalism. That's an issue. Come back mm-hmm. to Tozer. We need to think. Coming back on something else that you said about the Holy Spirit weekend and the Alpha Course. Now, my home church in Glasgow, which I have not been to for some time, but in the 90s, they bought into the Alpha Course. Some of my relatives uh, w- would still be there in my home church. And I remember having some debates with them and about my concerns about the Alpha Course. And uh, my background, as you may know, is, is the Church of the Nazarene. It's Wesleyan. So I said to them, what do you do with the Holy Spirit weekend? Because the Nazarene Church, for example, would not hold with speaking in tongues as being the, the initial evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I said to them, what, what, what do you do with the Holy Spirit weekend? And they said, well, we, as you said before, people amend it. Yeah. And so... That's what they said. Well, we just do our own thing. So I came back at them and said then, so it's not the Alpha Course. Because as soon as you amend it, it's not the Alpha Course. And by the way, in his book, How to Run the Alpha Course, Nicky Gumbel discourages teaching a different view of the Holy Spirit, as is in the Alpha Course. As soon as you make a course, though, and you make it as readily available... You can't, on the one hand, be ecumenical and then, on the other hand, say, I want you to lead it this way. He is an out-and-out charismatic, without a doubt. My understanding is uh, he is a huge fan of Jackie Pullinger, uh, who uh, is a missionary to Hong Kong and wrote that amazing book, Chasing the Dragon, which was one of the first books I read as a Christian, and it absolutely blew me away. But even at that point, in my understanding of, of Christianity, I was nervous about the... It was like amazing that seemingly everybody who got saved, who got transformed, brought out of drug addiction, whatever, became a Christian, seemed to always speak in tongues. And it wasn't until later on I realized that that was an actual thing. That is a understanding within many charismatic and Pentecostal uh, churches and denominations that that is the evidence. Now, I don't think there is anything that I can remember again, whether it's changed, that as you are praying for God to to uh, give spiritual gifts of some kind, that you had to speak in tongues. I think that's Jackie Pullinger's stance. So again, it's by association, isn't it? Nicky Gumbel might believe this. He's associated with people who definitely believe it. I don't think it's part of the course. So it's whether, again, you you throw it all out. I believe, as someone who, who holds to the, <laughs> the authority of scripture, that every single person who is a believer does have a gift. And actually, it's right to call it a spiritual gift. If you read through the book of Corinthians, you see that the, the, the God in Christ has gifted every single believer, but they are varied and different. And there are different lists in Romans 12 than there is in uh, in 1 Corinthians um, as to what those gifts are, whether that is the gift of healing, the gift of tongues, or whether that is the gift of generosity, or the gift of faith, or the gift of service, or the gift of teaching, or preaching, whatever it is. So, yeah, if that is part of the course as it is now, that you have to speak in tongues, I would completely disagree with that, and I don't think that is what the Bible teaches. But let me just clarify that. The main reason that I'm not a fan of it is not because of the lengthy discussion we've had, the deeper issue that it, it, it is soft and sin. Now, to me, that is the core of salvation. You know, it's, it's, it's been well said, the gospel is not about making bad people better, but dead people live. Modern evangelism, and we've had this conversation in previous podcasts about modern evangelism, is that it preaches to felt needs. 
The yeah. gospel is not about felt needs. Where I live in Sheffield, there's, there's an, I'm sure it's nationwide, there's the, the present advertising campaign for Alpha is a question mark. I see it in the back of buses. You yeah. know, and a question mark, what do you think? And every time I see it, I, I'm just compelled to verbally say, who cares? Because the gospel is cool. not a discussion. The whole point is, are you questioning? Are you wondering, what do you think about the Bible? What do you think about Jesus? Is the right question? You don't, you, most people aren't ready for you just to go in and say, you are a filthy sinner, and I need to tell you what Romans says. To ask people questions, leading questions, is a good place to start. There's a more fundamental point for me which I still haven't got to. The systematic preaching of the scriptures. That's my opening comment, but let, let me just get to that, right? Here's a quote. Alpha does not use strong terms and leaves us rather unclear about where we stand. As one follows its argument, sin is more to be seen in a way we have messed up our lives. According to Nicky Gumbel there, it's an inward-looking description of man's state that majors on his feelings of fearfulness. It's a picture of man predominated by his feelings of sadness and unhappiness. That's not just a flaw in the Alpha course. That's a flaw of modern evangelism. The same reason I would not run an Alpha course is the same reason I wouldn't run a Christianity Explored course. To me, there's a deeper issue here. What we in the church no longer believe about the preaching of the gospel, about the Lord's Day, about what happens when God's people are together in regard to the gospel being proclaimed. We, we, we present the gospel in many formats, right? But I'm talking about proclamation evangelism. And, you know, to me, the modern way of doing I'm not suggesting that we ride roughshod over people's feelings and their questions. What I'm saying is that a discussion is not the starting point for me. That if you look at the New Testament, when was the world ever ready for the gospel? When did Jesus send out people ahead of him? Matter of fact, his forerunner, John the Baptist, what was his opening gambit? How do you feel? It was repent, for the kingdom of God is near. What was Peter's very first sermon on the day of Pentecost? was was a confrontation of people's sin. And if we look at the history of revivals and the history of the Reformation, that's how it's always been done. But we live in a day of modern evangelism where we think that we're civilised and we have to be clever and let's have a discussion. What I'm saying is when we do it at the level of discussion, we are implicitly giving every opinion validity. Let me read to you from Alpha's own website. I quote, One of the most important parts of any Alpha is the chance to share thoughts and ideas in small groups. There's no obligation to say anything and there's nothing you can't share. It's an opportunity to hear from others and to contribute your own perspective in an honest, friendly, open environment. That can open the door if there's not a right priority to giving equality and legitimacy to every view and to every opinion and suggestion. Discussion is good for, for explaining. Discussion is good for, for nurturing. But it is not the place when it comes to validity. That's what I'm saying. The gospel is a proclamation. John Wesley had his, um, his band, you know, his, his house classes where people were nurtured. And this is why whether it be Christianity Explored or Alpha, and I'm just talking from a personal point of view, as a pastor, I would resign if there was a felt need in the local church to be having these things, because I'd be thinking, where am I failing in the preaching of the gospel Sunday by Sunday? If we are not proclaiming this and explaining this and having things in church where people can be nurtured uh, and all the rest of it, but when it comes to proclamation, as the first introduction, the pulpit used to be the first introduction, Tom. Not, not some round coffee cup meal, you know what I'm saying? And that's what I'm saying. To me, that's the fundamental problem, not ecumenicalism or whatever else, but what we no longer believe about the preaching of the, go the, preaching of the gospel, the Lord's Day, gospel services, the church being together, and the magnetism, when I was growing up in the church, 
and I've been in the church all my life, but I didn't get saved till I was 12. And I was in a church where people were getting saved every week. I know what it is to be in the hot seat under conviction. And in those days, there was a magnetism, particularly about a Sunday night, you know, because Sunday night used to be the gospel service. You know, we've lost that. And that's what I'm saying. This reveals to me what we no longer believe. And why do we think that we're so civilised and right today when in history where they've had revivals and we haven't had revivals? And maybe this is one of the reasons why. I mean, I've come from a background of not going to Sunday evening services. The church I'm in now, that up until very recently was doing an evening service, it wasn't a gospel service. Is that is that a Nazarene thing or is that an older church thing or is that always been the way I would just say it was an evangelical tradition evangelistic and evangelical yeah. church tradition let's say you're preaching at my church on Sunday night and no one's there from the community and no one's there who isn't a Christian I'm so glad you brought that up I mean the 25 years that I had the privilege of being a pastor the dynamics in society changed for example a good example of that is Sunday school you know, Sunday school in the local church, certainly where I was in, in Sheffield, uh, became a challenge because there were so many broken families that oftentimes children were away staying with the other parent at weekends. And so effectively, our Sunday school was our Wednesday night children's club. You see, that's a dynamic in society that's changed. When I was growing up, makes me sound really old, but in you know, the, the 70s and, and even 80s, when we had these traditionally... And it wasn't just a Nazarene thing, it was really just an evangelistic church. A lot of churches, and some, a lot of churches relatively still do it in those circles. Uh, but the dynamics change, you know, your Sunday night would have been your gospel service. It would have been different, the preaching would have been different, the singing would have been different from your Sunday morning worship service. But I found in the years that I was a pastor, the dynamics changed. More people got into what Martin Lloyd-Jones would call the oncers, the Sunday oncers, and that was your Christian's. But latterly, when the, in the years that I was a pastor, most of your unsaved would have been there in the morning. And your Sunday night folk would have been your really More committed, committed ones. Yeah. And also maybe people from other churches, Christians from other churches, whose church didn't have an evening service, so they come to yours. And so that then, I reversed it then. And so I tended to be more gospel, evangelistic in the morning. You fish where the people are, as it were you know, where the unsaved are. And so most of them are going to be in your church on a Sunday morning. That's when you preach evangelistically and it was more for believers on a Sunday night. I don't mm. know if that if that. Yeah, no, that helps. Question. Do you think there is uh, a contingent of people who wouldn't go to church, wouldn't go to a church service, but would come to something of a, a discussion, an introduction to, to Christianity? Do you think of that 24 million people that have done the course, are there any that wouldn't have turned up to a gospel meeting on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening? I'm sure there will be. But you see, I think a lot of it is down to what we have, what, what I said earlier, we, what we no longer believe about the church. If we can't even get believers there on the Lord's Day. What hope do we have of getting unsaved under the preaching of the gospel? Really? Well, exactly. But that, and that's my point, really, is that there may well be people that don't want to go to church. It's all well and good preaching evangelistically, but if no one's there, you, you're wasting your breath. If you, were, if you had an, a situation where you could preach Sunday evening and no one's there, or you could do a course where seven or eight people come on a Wednesday to your house and you have some food and you have a discussion, I understand that might not be the ideal. It might not be what we want. We want to stand up. And we want to preach the Bible systematically. But for some people, that's so far from where they're at that the introduction, the beginning way, if, if simply getting people thinking, uh, questioning the meaning of life, I, I wonder if it's just there is an, ide an idealised view of, of it's almost like you're presuming we're in the culture where everyone's meant to go to church or should be at church. You, and obviously we both think everyone should be at church, but they're not. If you're in an area where the vast majority, 98% of people in your local community don't go to church and don't want to go to church, and their view of Christians is a street preacher who's shouting at them about sin. I don't think they're just going to turn up on Sunday evening and realize I'm meant to go to church tonight, even though I'm not a Christian and I don't believe in Christianity. I don't believe in the Bible, but I need to go there to be told about the Bible. Maybe no, on the Bible belt, maybe. But, but why is it not? Because of what I'm saying, we're both agreeing here. 
I'm saying it's because of what the church has become and in large part no longer believes. I came across a survey. Do you know that 90, over 90% of non-church goers were asked, would you come to church if somebody invited you and brought you? And over 90% of those asked said yes. We no longer believe what we believe about the church. I believe that when the church is the church in terms of being the church and, and the presence of God is there, I believe the world can't stay away. But you see, we have become so unbiblical in our thinking that we open the doors of our church and we say to the world, come and see just how like you we really are. And we use worldly means to get people in and we really don't have them. Over the years that I was a pastor, Tom, I had people that I ultimately came to pastor who had been in previous churches through the Alpha Course. When they gave their testimony, every single one could not point to a decisive decision for Christ, but yet they call themselves Christians. They, have, they testified to no sense of sin, of personal brokenness, and no point of, of decision. For, forget society. Where has the impact really been felt in the local church through whether it's Alpha Course or Christianity Explored or whatever, where, where is the growth? Where, where, where is that? 24 million people have been. We're not, and in fairness, Alpha people aren't saying 24 million people have got saved. They're not saying that. But what I'm saying is, it's not enough just to go. You know, and my concern is the people that I've pastored, that they have been converted to a church or to a doctrine, but maybe not to Christ. And because we've been through a course, this is proof of nothing. Absolutely. So yeah, I, you can do the course and not become a Christian. And I think there is a point on the course where you're encouraged to make a decision. But I always think anything that's formulaic like that is ultimately going to be unhelpful. There'll be situations where some people are ready very quickly. Do you know what I mean? If you are convicted of sin and say through the preaching that you're talking about, someone might be ready to make a commitment after one preach. There might be others though that over years of talking and praying and, you know what I mean, and chatting through with them, they come to a place. The Lord moves in different ways, doesn't he, in terms of uh, that. So, yeah, the formula might not always work. I don't know. It'd be very interesting to know from the 24 million people what the impact is. The only pushback I would give in terms of local evangelism, I, I don't think it's an either or in a sense. I think not everyone is gifted to be an evangelist. I believe it's a gift from God. But everyone is called to be witnesses for Christ. And every one of us is called to the Great Commission to make disciples. And for most people, that is the most terrifying part of being a Christian, that you're called to share your faith with others. And most people don't know where to start and they overcomplicate it and they get very concerned and nervous and, and worried about what that's going to look like. If you're able to invite some of your friends to come and be involved in a course that is, without a doubt, fairly shallow and fairly simple and light to start... Is, is a good way than more, more than just the pastor of the church, which would be you in your setting, Sunday evening gospel meeting, you're the person who's preaching, you're preaching evangelistically, you're trying to fulfill the Great Commission. Where are the rest of the church, people who aren't gifted in the way that you're gifted to preach, but actually can invite someone, maybe they can invite them to the church service, but they can actually be more involved hands-on in terms of a discussion with people through the course. So, I think the idea of a course I don't have an issue with, and I think Christianity Explored, from what I have seen, is better. Neither of them, of course, or Christianity Explored, have I seen much in terms of response, people genuinely getting saved. In answer to the original question, whether it be Christianity Explored or Alpha or any other thing, the danger for these things is that they become, we, we perceive them as, as the answer to everything. They're great instruments, they're terrible masters. There should be an enhancement to evangelism, not a replacement for evangelism. So I guess I guess that's the bottom line, okay? One of the things I would say is, you maybe know the story of D.L. Moody when he preached in, Ch in Chicago mm. and he'd done six weeks, six Sunday nights on the life of Christ. And at the end of the sixth Sunday, he said to this congregation, now, if you would like to follow this son of God, Jesus Christ, come back next week and I'll tell you how. That following week was the great Chicago fire and hundreds of people, who, many of whom were in that service, died in that fire. And D.L. Moody never got over that. He said, I will never ever preach again 
without the awareness that this might be the last time A, I get to preach or B, somebody gets to hear me. So every time I preach and preach the gospel in particular, I want to preach in such a way that anybody who is unsaved could be in no doubt as to the gravity of their situation. I don't want, I want unsaved people to come to church, but I don't want them to be comfortable in the presence of God because if they are, they're not in the presence of God. They might be in the presence of a church, but they're not in the presence of God. We need to rediscover the gravity. Remember what it means to be lost. People are going to hell and there's only one way to be saved. And the gospel makes its appeal. The Ten Commandments, for example, where do they make their appeal to? Not the intellect, but the heart. And the gospel appeal primarily, and I'm not saying we, we, we jettison our intellect, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying sometimes we can, we can be too clever and make our appeal to the intellect. Remember, Tozer said, if somebody can argue you to Christ, there'll be somebody that come along can argue you away from Christ. The gospel appeal is aimed, first of all, at the heart, at the, at the conscience, not the felt needs and not the questions or discussions, but there's a proclamation to the conscience. The gospel is not an invitation so much as it is an ultimatum. And that is the urgency I'm really trying to express. Well, on that note, we'll draw this podcast to a, a close. Thanks so much for sticking with us. You know the score. We'd always love to hear what you think, uh, what you agree with, what you disagree with. Send us an email to info at gnba.net. And myself and Stuart will be back next month. See you then. God bless. God bless.